My dad is a World War II historian, and as a kid, I'd always notice him watching these bad World War II movies and shows. He'd point out everything wrong, how the gear was incorrect, or the planes were a different model. He wasn't satisfied often. So, if my dad hated these movies so much, why did he keep watching them? I think World War II just started! Years later, and working on my own historical project, I finally get it. I've seen every major film about 9-11, and can now see the reason why my dad kept watching is because he wanted to see someone get World War II right. There are films and shows that do, Band of Brothers, Das Boot, Saving Private Ryan, but the small details in true life films are what win over historians. If you ask the historian what they would want to see in a movie about their respective time period, they aren't going to say what everyone knows. They're going to say they want to see the things no one talks about. Oliver Stone's biopic W features no scenes of 9-11 as it happened, but prominently features the infamous incident where George W. Bush choked on a pretzel. And that's why Stone made the movie. He knew audiences had seen enough on 9-11, but this would be new. When I see a 9-11 movie, I want to see the boat lifts, I want to see the rescue dogs, I want to see the stories of men and women stuck at airports across the country. And that's why I keep watching, good or bad. So where to begin? I'm going to rank every major 9-11 movie and tell you which ones are worth your time. There'll be no docudramas or documentaries except for one notable exception. If you want to know now, 102 Minutes of Change in America and the Nade Brothers film 9-11 are the best September 11th documentaries. Nothing else comes close. Please check those out if you're willing to sit through some pretty horrific footage and audio. There are also films that exist because of 9-11, but they're not 9-11 movies, and those will not be on the list. Rain Over Me, 25th Hour, they're great, but they're post-9-11 movies. The criteria here is that the film be about 9-11 or the following days in September, plain and simple. There are 15 films to rank, going worst to best. Before we start, there's a movie I'm going to talk about that will not be ranked. The 2002 film 110901, September 11. This is an anthology project that brought together 11 acclaimed and some Oscar-nominated directors from around the world to produce 11-minute shorts inspired by the attacks. Pretty cool idea. The issue is this movie is impossible to find online, and as a result, I was only able to watch half the film by digging up segments that have been shared individually across the web. The most famous short of the bunch, USA, directed by Sean Penn, is also one of the stupidest short films I've ever seen. You flowers! <laughs> Ernest Borgnine, known to my generation as Mermaid Man, Evil. plays an elderly man who lives in the shadow of the Twin Towers. His now deceased wife kept flowers in the window, which die with her from the lack of sun. On 9-11, the towers come down and sunlight returns to the old man's apartment, bringing new life to his flowers as he rejoices. Obviously, it's not a good look to show a man rejoicing and life returning as the towers fall. This film isn't trying to take a patriotic stance. Many of its shorts are directly critical of the United States government and its foreign policy. The UK short features a Chilean man writing a letter directly addressed to the people of New York City that tells of his own September 11th. The Chilean coup of 1973 that was supported by the US. This shows the core issue of the film though, that many of its shorts are interested in saying something rather than how they say it. A character directly writing a letter to New York City is very strange exposition and that was never going to feel natural when he could just talk to someone and tell the story normally. The best short is the Burkina Faso story in which a group of boys see a man who looks like Bin Laden and try to capture him for reward money. The worst is Penn's USA short. Among the more infamous is Oscar winner Alejandro Iñárritu's short Mexico, which has nothing to do with Mexico and is instead exactly what you're seeing now, a black screen. Audio of the attacks plays as images of 9-11 jumpers flash at random. It's effectively done, but I think disgustingly offensive, and I couldn't bring myself to finish watching it. The whole point of this film is to show perspectives from across the world, and the Mexico film is just real exploitive footage of men and women in their final moments. It goes against the whole point of the bigger picture. I'm not ranking this because I couldn't view the other half of it, but even if I had and all the other films are great, I don't see myself giving it a positive review based on the presence of Penn and Inuritu shorts alone. No, I'm telling you the truth. Somebody hit the damn thing with a little plane. 15, 9-11, 2017, director Martin Gigi. I'm gonna get this out of the way now and say this is one of the worst films I've ever seen. And I'm not just saying that because I'm offended by it from a historical 9-11 standpoint. This is the worst kind of bad movie, the one you can't even enjoy for being bad. Where there is billowing smoke mixed Come with on. Just... Charlie Sheen plays a king of Wall Street who's stuck in a World Trade Center elevator with his divorcing wife and three other strangers. I, I need you to suck this. I just do. <laughs> really? In here? Right now? I think the reason why this movie exists is because the filmmaker saw an opportunity. No major feature film had been released under the name 9-11. Someone was going to make that title eventually, and we probably got the worst possible version of it. There's not even any reason to call it 9-11, as the core story of strangers being stuck in an elevator wouldn't change if this was about a fictional terrorist attack. They also rely only on stock news footage of the attacks to tell their story, which is as lazy and ineffective as possible. 
The majority of the movie is Charlie Sheen in an elevator asking questions. How do you accidentally crash a plane into one of the largest buildings in New York City? It's some of the laziest exposition I've ever seen in a movie. Sheen is literally introduced smoking a cigarette and is like, Sorry, didn't know there's no smoking in the World Trade Center. Everything this movie does is obvious and lazy. Is this one going down? At some point. Most controversial of all, Charlie Sheen is a truther, one of the most prominent in Hollywood. It's pretty insane the production hired him knowing this, but you can tell the actual reason he's there is because of his role in Wall Street. In a way, it was like they were trying to make a sequel to Wall Street, just with 9-11. The building is coming down. You have got to go. A terrible movie hiding behind tragedy for attention as it pretends to honor it. Do not watch this. How was that? 0.5 out of 5. <laughs> 14. Rudy, The Rudy Giuliani Story. Director Robert Dornhelm. After watching Sheen's 9-11, I had a note written saying no bad 9-11 film can be entertaining and that's why bad 9-11 films are so bad. I had to delete that note after watching this film because it is objectively hilarious. If you want a barometer on how bad this is, Mike Myers' Cat in the Hat came out in the same year, and I rank it below that. You're not just wrong, you're stupid. It's impossible not to view Rudy through a modern gaze, but that doesn't matter here. I have never seen what is basically a propaganda biopic made in support of its subject, where that subject comes out looking like human garbage at the end. Shut up! Affairs, lies, temper. He breaks up with his mistress in public, and she blames Hillary Clinton. I mean, this is because of Hillary, isn't it? Yeah, I'm afraid of Hillary Clinton. It is poorly made, poorly structured, and laughably bad. As for the 9-11 scenes, they show the wrong tower collapse. How hard is it to get that right? What makes the scenes work so poorly is the film's non-linear, so they cut from Rudy getting prostate cancer to suddenly 9-11, and it keeps doing that. Major life event, cut back to 9-11 again and again. If you love Rudy, you'll hate it. If you hate Rudy, you'll love that you hate it. One out of five. People told me I'm very odd all the time. I got tested once to see if I had Asperger's disease. 13. Extremely loud and incredibly close. 2011, director Stephen Daldry. I have a love-hate relationship with Oscar bait films. The idea of a film being made solely to ride the wave of winning awards, but utterly failing is why these films are my guilty pleasure. I go into them with the same mindset as a comedy and usually have a good time. Extremely loud and incredibly close is not and can never be a good time. I don't find it offensive like Sheen's film, but it is one of the more misguided films I've seen. The main character's mom finds a 9-11 jumper pop-up book her son made and actually smiles at it like, oh, he's remembering his father, that's nice. So this is about a kid with Asperger's dealing with the death of his father in 9-11. He finds a key that belonged to his father and goes all over New York City trying to find out what it unlocks. It's a pretty emotionally manipulative film, but it at least has some positives. Max von Sydow's great and Tom Hanks' phone calls from inside the towers are heartbreaking. They knew the emotional effect casting America's dad as a 9-11 victim would have. Cliché is an Oscar formula rule here, and that's what kills it. You can tell everything serves a set pattern that exists because they think that's what's going to win them the most awards. Having watched so many of these films, I could tell this was going to feature a scene where the main character has a shouting match with his mom and says, Oh, I wish you died, not dad. I wish it were you in the building instead of him. And there it is. So do I. Those shouting match scenes exist because shouting means acting, and acting means Oscars. I said I don't find this movie offensive, but it is rather sad that the filmmaker saw the double hitter of 9-11 and autism and thought that meant Oscar gold. For 25 years, we've seen films desperately try to replicate the success of Forrest Gump. Wait, this was from the writer of Forrest Gump? 1.5 out of 5. You have authorization to shoot down any aircraft deemed a threat. Presidential authority? That is correct. 12. Vice, 2018. Director Adam McKay. Vice is pushing the criteria, but I do consider it a 9-11 film. What terrorist attack would you have let go forward so you wouldn't seem like a mean and nasty fella? This was my most anticipated movie of the year, and I loved Adam McKay's prior film, The Big Short. But Vice is a letdown. Everything that worked in The Big Short falls flat here because of one key difference. Vice talks down to its audience. You would say that libtard. Quit. Amazing performances and some really creative storytelling can't save a movie when it pretends to be smarter than the audience. I can't wait to see the new Fast and the Furious movie. That looks lit. Vice presents the Iraq war being a bad idea, like it's a new concept that the stupid viewer is just now being informed of. It doesn't work, and in the end, I think even the filmmakers knew that. Watch the deleted scenes and you'll see they removed a musical number. They went hog wild with ideas, and the end result is a mess. If it were for just the 9-11 scenes, Vice would rank much higher on the list. These are the best parts of the movie, and they do a great job not only showing the madness of that day, but contrasting it with Cheney's cold and calculated response. 
Fail's great as always. I like stylized movies, but I think the serious scenes are the only ones that work here. Spilling forth its ruby jelly treasures. 1.5 out of 5. See it if you're interested, but even if you like it, it's no big short. Eleven, The Looming Tower, 2018. The Looming Tower follows FBI agents through the years leading up to 9-11 as they investigate terror attacks and attempt to stop the big one they know is coming, despite a lack of cooperation from the CIA. I had a coworker first recommend this to me and say, oh, you're gonna be so angry because of what this series shows. I was angry, all right, but not for the reasons he thought. Three cardinal sins here. The social network has ruined the biopic genre because everyone thinks they're Aaron Torkin now and tries to write like him. The I am very smart exposition writing here is so removed from reality. It's like the Mercury theme in Terminator 2. Never saw it. In the movie, the enemy, the T-1000, which is an android assassin played by Robert Patrick, has harnessed the properties of liquid metal, which quickly disperses and reconstitutes. Therefore, he is virtually impossible to defeat. Bin Laden is espousing an ideology that exists at the cellular level. After Jeff Daniels gets hired as the head of security at the World Trade Center, his girlfriend says something like, As a kid, I went to the restaurant in the North Tower. That's the 107th floor, all the way up top. Lady, he knows the restaurant's at the top of the building. He is literally the head of security there. Are you afraid of heights? They tried to humanize Muhammad Atta and the other terrorists, and as a result, basically every scene of him is unintentionally hilarious. He comes off as a Clark Griswold of a group of hijackers. Finally, it's a historically inaccurate portrayal of a time period all the writers lived through. That last one kills me. I'm actually in support of simplifying and condensing moments in nonfiction stories. I don't care if Abe Lincoln didn't say that quote for another year because it's in his character to eventually say it. I don't care if people are combined into one composite character because it would be too complicated to follow multiple characters. What bothers me is changing history to serve an agenda. The Social Network has so many fictional additions to the life of Mark Zuckerberg, but they're all in character. Zuckerberg never went on a date with Rooney Mara. But if he did, he would have been a jerk with an overinflated opinion of himself who would wear cargo shorts. That's why the social network works. It gets that right. I don't understand. Which part? The Looming Tower is not within character, and it's actually offensive in how it portrays some events. The bombing of the USS Cole in particular, where a child joins the terrorists in their suicide mission. No children died in the Cole bombing, and it's so offensive adding a child to the terrorist team to generate... Sympathy? I don't know. The kids are there to symbolize the innocent children that have died in the Middle East, but the Cole's a real event where people were murdered. It disrespects their memory to change history because you want to prove a point. 1.5 out of 5. Desperately wants to be smarter and more impactful than it is. A second plane has hit the second tower. America is under attack. 10. DC, 9-11. Time of Crisis, 2003. Director Brian Trenchard Smith. I won't spend much time on this since literally no one has heard of it. Crocodile Hunter Collision Course actor Timothy Bottoms reprises his role as President George W. Bush in the Showtime original movie following the president and his response to the attacks. Bottoms was one of the most prominent Bush impersonators of the time. He actually had his own sitcom produced by the South Park guys called That's My Bush. But he didn't sound like him at all in my opinion. Whoever did this isn't gonna like me as president. There were times I was watching the movie and I'd forget I was watching Bush. He just came off as the generic president in an action movie. Outside of the CGI, there's actually nothing bad here. It's just so boring. The movie is entirely exposition of politicians talking and talking and talking. It's like a Wikipedia page recreated by C-listers. There are some standouts, the actor for Donald Rumsfeld is great, and I respect how they recreated the locations, but you'd be better off just watching the actual footage. Two out of five. An orchestrated string of airline hijackings has occurred. These planes were used in a surprise attack on the World Trade Center in New York. Number 9. Tiger Cruise, 2004, director Dwayne Dunham. A group of Navy kids go on a sea trip before the attacks and are stranded on board when the nation goes on lockdown. This is the Disney Channel original movie take on 9-11 and while I respect Disney for producing a 9-11 film appropriate for kids to experience and learn from, it's still a Disney 9-11 film and there's no way for that concept to not be awkward. Tiger Cruise is interesting as a portrait of its time but also already dated 15 years later. The music changes to a hip-hop beat when the lead black kid is on screen. Ooh, yeah. Consistently awkward with stilted dialogue, but it has good intentions and heart. Two out of five. Okay, kids, look, in case you didn't realize, we've got a little bit of a national emergency going on here, huh? Number eight, The Space Between, 2010. Director Travis Fine. An alcoholic flight attendant travels with a stranded Muslim boy after all flights are grounded on 9-11. 
This is a really spectacular idea. I definitely want to see more 9-11 stories set outside of New York, showing the chaos in airports and fear in small towns throughout America, but this movie just covers too much ground. Would have been great if it was basically a my dinner with Andre that barely left the car in hotel rooms. Might want to cool it on the a la a la routine for a little while, huh? Instead, one of the main characters actually loses someone in the attacks. The story is interesting enough without that, but the filmmakers couldn't resist the setup. That death feels very cheap and not earned because for once this 9-11 story wasn't about what was happening in New York. It was about an entire nation grieving and scared of what comes next. Simplicity is king. Don't lose yourself exploring all the things your movie could be rather than focusing on the core of what your story is. 2 out of 5, check it out if it sounds interesting to you. I can see people liking it, but not remembering it later. Governor Bush, it's Michael Moore. Behave yourself, will you? Go find real work. <laughs> 7. Fahrenheit 9-11, 2004, director Michael Moore. Oh boy, the big one. This is the only documentary included, and I'm including it because it's the most important documentary of the last 20 years. It also grossed more of the box office than any other film in this list, so I think that gives it a pass. People love to know my thoughts on this one, and I'll make it simple. This documentary is a work of genius, and I gave that work of genius a thumbs down. Michael Moore is a master documentarian, and anyone who wants to explore the genre can learn a crash course on how to control a viewpoint by watching this man's films. Images of 9-11 never appear in the film because Michael Moore knew the audience had already seen them a hundred times and the shocked faces of the New Yorkers would be far more effective. Genius. Moore finds the dumbest and most emotionally provoked people to interview. Genius. Moore ends his film on the mother of a deceased Iraq War soldier, sobbing for her dead son as the White House looms in the background. Absolute genius, and one of the most iconic film images of its decade. So why don't I like it? Same reason as Space Between. Simplicity. I think Moore's viewpoints work best alone, but Falter is part of a bigger picture. This movie opens by pushing the conspiracy theory of why the government flew Bin Laden's family out of the States after 9-11. It is so easy to explain why that happened, though. Bin Laden is a huge family name, and most of them are not fans of Cousin Osama ruining that namesake. Moore's points against the Iraq War are great, and so well put together, but bogged down by the prior points that tread conspiracy water like that useless Bin Laden family narrative. By far the worst scene is when Moore narrates over footage of Bush on 9-11 and pretends to be the voice inside of his head. As Bush sat in that Florida classroom, was he wondering if maybe he should have shown up to work more often? Moore is a master manipulator, and if you can see past that, his films lose their appeal. Watch this. I wonder if while holding this coveted award alongside Harvey Weinstein, Moore was remembering all the rumors about his producer. Did he think this gold idol was worth the pain of those women? Do you all see how manipulative that is? It's, it's propaganda. Moore can manipulate one thing at a time, but the strings get tied when he covers too many points at once. That's what happens in Fahrenheit. Despite the genius of its singular scenes, the big picture can't handle its aspirations to take down Bush entirely and stop him from getting a second term. 2 out of 5. I highly recommend watching it though so you can form your own opinion. Boston Center, we're confused. What flight is being hijacked? American 11 or United 175? But, um, both, I'm, I'm afraid. 6. The Path to 9-11, 2006, director David L. Cunningham. This is a pretty rare find because it was banned from having a DVD release for political reasons. That was interesting enough for me to want to check it out. Path to 9-11 is an earlier TV event take on the Looming Tower storyline, and it paints a far less favorable portrait of the Clinton administration. It's based on the 9-11 Commission report, and some other stuff. ABC! <laughs> Clinton's administration needs to be held just as accountable as Bush's, but the filmmakers get several historical and technical points wrong, and it brings down everything else. It is not only accurate, but very well done. The final 30 minutes are among the best recreated takes of 9-11 I've ever seen. And the betrayal of the terrorists isn't unintentionally hilarious here, like in Looming Tower. It's kind of insane to me how absolutely massive the controversy section is on Path's Wikipedia page, when I felt that Looming Tower had far more inaccuracies in agenda pushing. They're both offenders, but unlike Tower, Pat knows exactly what it is, and isn't trying to be something else. If you do watch, please also read up on the controversies afterwards. That way you can know where fact and fiction lie, and make your own decision. 2.5 out of 5. You ready? <laughs> okay. Let's roll. 5. Flight 93, 2006. Director Peter Markle. A made-for-TV take in the passenger revolt of United Airlines Flight 93. Absolutely pales in comparison to Paul Greengrass's United 93 released that same year, and has no lasting power today, but it is important that films like this get made on TV in 2006. I still have people ask me, don't you think it's strange they were able to call their families when they couldn't use cell phones on the plane? The planes had built-in phones, you could use your credit card. This film shows that. The CGI sucks, it's melodramatic and standard, but if Flight 93 showed one random person who came across it on cable that their stupid conspiracy was wrong, then it was worth it.
Still, Flight 93 is a cheap product. You can see mountains in the background when the plane takes off from Jersey. While I'm giving this film a thumbs up, there's still no reason to watch it when United 93 exists. 2.5 out of 5. Hmm, quite a day. 4. Remember Me, 2010. Director Alan Coulter. Fair warning, I'm going into spoilers with this review. I actually remember going on a date, telling the girl what I'd do, and the first thing she said was, Oh, have you seen that Robert Pattinson movie? For the majority of people, this is the definitive 9-11 movie, and a lot of them hate it because of its inclusion of 9-11. I'm not big in the tortured soul romance genre, so I went in with low expectations and ended up really liking it precisely because of the reason a lot of people hate it. The movie's pretty standard. Bad boy meets good girl, father issues, lovers reconcile. We've seen it a hundred times before. Then, out of nowhere, Robert Pattinson dies in 9-11 and the movie ends. There are small hints as to what's approaching. The characters watch American Pie 2 in theaters, which was released the summer of 01. If you know that, you know September's right around the corner for these characters. People hate this movie because the ending came out of nowhere, but that's precisely why I liked it. For the majority of Americans, 9-11 itself came out of nowhere, and the filmmakers were trying to convey that. They made a rather standard and often boring romantic drama that is suddenly turned upside down with the most shocking event of the 21st century. It's genius and obviously effective. If you hate it because of the 9-11 scene, you're missing the point. I think this movie is about 10 years too early. With almost two decades of retrospect, this could have been an early O's period piece on par with Days and Confused take in the mid-70s. Instead, we have a forgettable and average chick flick that is forgettable and average on purpose to serve a pretty amazing twist. 2.5 out of 5, but it's closer to a 3. If you can watch this with someone who doesn't know the ending, then by all means do. Hey, where'd the buildings go? Hey, where'd the buildings go? Good God, dude. 3. World Trade Center, 2006. Director Oliver Stone. People were really worried about this film when it came out. Oliver Stone is famous for directing the most well-known conspiracy film of all time, and they thought that's what this would be. Not the case. With the exception of the one surreal scene featuring Jesus Christ, World Trade Center is one of Stone's most restrained films. The majority of the story takes place underground, with Michael Pena and Nick Cage trapped in the rubble of Ground Zero. Much like Remember Me, I wonder what this film would have been like if it came out today. World Trade Center is a PG-13 take on mass murder, and you can tell the filmmakers were afraid to show too much of what was still a fresh wound. This was only five years later. It's not like Titanic where you can show whatever you want, with no offense taken by the audience. No will! This was never trying to be the Titanic of 9-11 films, though. It's a story about the men lost and saved that day, not about seeing the moment either plane hit. It just took us an hour to get up to 30 in Tower 1. I didn't want us over in 2. What happened in 2? I don't know. The structure of this film is a bit stiff. There are quite a few non-linear films on this list, and I think World Trade Center would have worked better if it started in the rubble and was told through progressive flashbacks. I've grown less critical on it with time, as this is actually a movie I'd feel comfortable showing a younger person interested in learning about the attacks. Three out of five. Just moved here? September 7th. Oh no. Oh yes. Well, it can only get better, right? <laughs> Two. WTC View. 2005, director Brian Sloan. The most obscure movie on this list and the biggest surprise for me. This is a story of a gay man in Soho looking for a roommate following the attacks. And it deserves a place right beside 25th Hour as one of the best depictions of New York after the towers came down. Broke up with my boyfriend too. Wow. When did you guys break up? A couple weeks ago. Well, at least you can blame it on Bin Laden. <laughs> it shows those little things I was talking about the historians love. The fear of breathing in the air around you. The heavy feeling when a siren wails past or a plane flies overhead. The attempt at having a normal conversation with a lover but only being able to talk about the attacks. These are the moments that ruled New York City in America, and 9-11 movies don't seem to show that. They want to show the horror and not the humanity. This film shows the humanity. WTC View never shows 9-11 as it happens, but its characters just talking about the event is more effective than most movies showing it. And I hear this huge bang behind me, and about 20 feet away is what I guess is a body, not because it looks like one, but because of all the blood. So I look up to see two more coming down, holding up these tablecloths as makeshift parachutes that would work for a few seconds, then don't. I hope it moves to a streaming platform in the future so more people can stumble upon it like I did. Four to five, please seek this one out and give it support. WTC View deserves to be noticed. One. United 93, 2006, director Paul Greengrass. 
I'm going to show you one clip from this movie, just one, that displays how effective it is. Would you mind bringing me some water with my breakfast? I have to take some pills. Sure. I want to cry every time I see that scene. United 93 ranks so highly on the list of great movies you never want to see again for that reason. It's devastating because it doesn't lose itself in spectacle. The way they show the second plane hit is incredible. When so many lesser films resorted to stock news footage, United 93 focused on the human response, always the human response. What were the passengers feeling? What were the air traffic control operators feeling? Even what were the hijackers feeling? It's incredible and has some of the most heartbreaking final minutes ever put to film. I don't have anything else to say besides experience this movie. No breaks, no pauses, just sit down and feel what it was like to live through this tragedy. On the ground and in the air. Five out of five, a masterpiece. So what's the future for 9-11 cinema? The hit musical, Come From Away, about Operation Yellow Ribbon, which brought grounded planes and passengers from all over to Gander, Newfoundland on 9-11, will be receiving a film adaption. An acclaimed director, Yorgos Lanthimos, will be adapting My Year of Rest and Relaxation, which tells the story of a girl who decides to sleep an entire year between 2000 and 2001. You can guess what she wakes up to. Those are just the films confirmed as I make this video, but you'll see a lot more bolder takes on 9-11 in the next decade. I don't see things being as restrained as World Trade Center or Remember Me. Enough time has passed now that some viewers are more comfortable with the idea of using the attacks for entertainment. That sounds harsh, but all movies are entertainment. We also know the cliches and tropes of the early O's, and as more time passes, more people become nostalgic for it. The Looming Tower tried and failed to be a period piece. Listen to this scene. I don't want to play video games with you either, okay? Really? Are you sure? Because there's this new game out from PlayStation. Gran Turismo. It's high-end car racing. Apparently the graphics are super lifelike. It comes off as so disingenuous. Like the writers just wrote in whatever was popular at the time. Alright, look at this picture. Where the twin towers burn behind a billboard for the infamous Mariah Carey box office bomb, Glitter. This is the future of 9-11 cinema, nostalgia pieces. Looking back in the year 2001 and remembering these pants and ska music just as much as 9-11. The foreground is just as important as the background here. This is the trend that all decades follow. The kids that grew up during that decade become filmmakers and they're ready to tell stories that form their own sense of nostalgia. They're gonna wanna tell stories of a time that shaped who they are. If you wanna see a story told, you tell it. That has and always will be the future of cinema. Where were you on 9-11? American September is a documentary film project collecting stories from all over the world. Visit AmericanSeptember.com to share your story and view the memories collected so far. If you'd like to see more videos on 9-11 history and its impact and culture, please subscribe to the channel.